Midweek Pictorial, February 26, 1920 Spectacular fire on board the U.S. shipping board vessel Brooklyn in Havana Harbor, Cuba. The flames totally destroyed the vessel and spread also to the warehouses of the American Chemical Company across the bay. The vessel was loaded with nitrates, and the explosions were heard for miles. The Princess Anne broken in two on Rockaway Point, Long Island, where it was driven by the recent terrific storm. The crack in the side shows where the vessel broke. This photograph was taken from an Aero seaplane, which swept down to within 100 feet of the ship for that purpose. New police traffic tower erected near the intersection of 42nd Street and 5th Avenue, New York, one of the busiest and most congested traffic spots on that great thoroughfare. The traffic is directed by a policeman in the booth. Colored electric lights are used as night signals. Similar booths are placed at various points along the avenue. Traffic policemen in Washington have recently been furnished with mirrors attached to their stands, which enable them to see what is coming behind them. The device has proved very satisfactory and efficient. Firemen of the 31st Engine Company, New York, using a steam hose to clear the street of snow before their firehouse. The blockade of the streets has formed a serious menace to the city in case of conflagration. If the eastern coast of the United States has suffered greatly from the severity of the winter, the harbors have been at least clear enough of ice to permit river and harbor traffic in the main, though under difficulties. Much worse has been the plight of Canada, as shown in the above picture of the Quebec Harbor Basin. Fishing smacks, trawlers, wooden freighters, and even some of the American Eagle boats are here portrayed as tied up by the ice, which in that climate comes early and stays late. Italian immigrants photographed upon their arrival here recently on the steamship Giuseppe Verdi. The after-the-war tide of immigration has begun to set in, and while the labor situation makes this desirable, great care is being exercised to keep out revolutionary advocates. Impressive Lincoln Memorial Services in House of Representatives, February 12, 1920. Uncle Joe Cannon, oldest member of the House in terms of service, reading Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Sackville Street, the main thoroughfare of Dublin, capital of Ireland. The view is taken from O'Connell Bridge and shows the O'Connell Monument, and in the background, the Nelson Pillar. The environs of the city are remarkably beautiful, and its bay is noble and picturesque. Population of the Metropolitan District is about 400,000. The metropolis claims a high antiquity, having been in existence, it is alleged, since the time of Ptolemy. Belfast, Ireland, showing High Street. The city is the chief manufacturing center of Ireland. It is the great depot of the linen trade. Its commerce is extensive and rapidly increasing. The city is not imposing, as it is built on low ground, but it has many handsome buildings. Numerous railways center there. Its population of over 300,000 is largely Protestant, and it is the center of Ulster sentiment. Kilkenny is a picturesque town about 62 miles southeast of Dublin on the River Nore, which divides it into the Irish and English towns. With the exception of the suburbs, the city is well built of stone, and its streets are paved with black marble quarried in the vicinity. At Kilkenny College, Swift, Congreve, and Berkeley were educated. Cork is the third city in Ireland in point of population, being exceeded in that respect only by Dublin and Belfast. At left is shown St. Anne Shandon Church, and on the right, St. Mary's Church. The town was founded in the 6th century, probably by the Danes. It has extensive manufactures and commerce. Blarney Castle, near Cork, Ireland, once the stronghold of the McCarthys. The famous Blarney Stone is reached with difficulty, but once kissed is supposed to endow the tongue with persuasive power. Carpet Factory in County Donegal, where rugs and carpets of close weave, rich colors, and rare beauty are manufactured by Irish women. Westport in County Mayo, a seaport town with fisheries and trade of considerable importance, though of late they have diminished in volume. It is the scene of a recent clash with the authorities. Part of one of the lakes of Killarney, famous in song and story for their bewildering beauty. Thackeray describes them as the most beautiful in the world, and his verdict has been generally endorsed. There are three of the lakes, containing many heavily wooded islands. They are set in a frame of mountains clothed in luxuriant vegetation. Direct photographic study obtained near Galway of a sturdy Irishman of the old type. 
He was 85 years old, but hale and hearty, and trudged into Galway on every market day. Typical Irish Colleen, the belle of the village, with the dark Irish type of beauty, standing before the door of her house in a little Irish town. Quaint scene in a street of an Irish village, showing the thatched roofs of the houses, the flower pots in the windows, the housewife before the door, and the jaunting car drawn by a pair of patient donkeys and filled to overflowing with children. Bleaching fields of linen mills at Lisburn, near Belfast. Irish linen is famous all over the world, and is one of the principal industries of the country. Ballyshannon, in County Donegal, on the River Erne, which is famous for its salmon fishing and yearly attracts a great number of enthusiastic sportsmen. At this point on the river is shown the famous Salmon Leap. Platform figures at Tokyo Meeting of the Salvation Army. At left is the Marquis Okuma, a distinguished statesman, formerly Japanese Premier and Minister of Foreign Affairs. Beside him is General Johannes de Gut, head of the mission. Large Japanese audience at Tokyo, Japan, listening to addresses of members of Salvation Army. Seen in front of the Japanese upper house, corresponding to our Senate, on its opening day. A picturesque contrast between the old and new regimes is indicated by the jinrikishas and the automobiles. Members of the Japanese cabinet in their national costumes at a dinner party. Sailors from the USS Olympia on a reconnoitering expedition with Trow as their destination. Their headquarters are at Spalato. French troops arriving in Berlin to see that the terms of the peace treaty are carried out. They are shown here as passing the Russian-German Bank of Commerce and Industry. Only a small detachment was sent. Sailors of the Atlantic Fleet at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, at practice on the largest rifle range in existence. The men are using the Lewis machine guns, and a high standard of excellence in shooting is demanded. General view of the world's largest rifle range, which accommodates 3,000 men firing at one time. It is the practice field for the Jackies of Admiral Wilson's Atlantic Fleet, some of whom are here seen in training. That the army is keeping up its training and utilizing the lessons learned in the World War is shown by this picture of a tank battle, recently staged at Camp Meade, Maryland, as nearly as possible under conditions of actual warfare. Monster tanks and whippets charging trenches in sham battle at Camp Meade. The trenches are purposely made as difficult as were those on the Western Front. Note the disabled tank and trench at left. Picturesque gathering of delegates from the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Indians in Washington to confer with governmental authorities regarding the leases on their oil lands. Both these tribes are offshoots of the Algonquin tribe, from whom they separated in the 17th century, migrating to their present locations in Montana, Wyoming, and Oklahoma. They are noted for the symbolic character of their decorative art. The amicable nature of their mission is symbolized by their peace pipes. In the foreground are Sato Sells, Indian Commissioner, and his assistant, E.W. Merritt. Full-blood and half-blood Osage Indians who have come to the national capital to discuss with the Commission on Indian Affairs a revision of the laws governing the leases on oil and gas property on their reservations. These, under the present laws, will cease to pay dividends after 1931, and the Indians are seeking an extension.